Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ray, and welcome to the RayWenderlich.com podcast. In this podcast, we'll keep you up to date with the latest app development tech talk. Now, here are your hosts, Drew Freeman and Alex Sullivan. Thanks, Ray. This is the Ray Wenderlich podcast. Welcome to episode five for season 10. This episode was recorded on Saturday, the 11th of April for release on the 22nd, 2020. This episode is sponsored by PBS. PBS is hiring a senior iOS engineer to work on their PBS video and PBS kids video apps. These apps educate, inspire, and entertain. If you're excited to deliver millions of streams to viewers like you, consider yourself a candidate. Engineers who are enthusiastic, collaborative, and lifelong learners do well on their teams. At PBS, a senior engineer makes decisions on the tech stack and lives with the consequences. They trailblaze a path through tricky bits of code for the sake of the product. They coordinate with other engineers on their product and communicate with teams of dependency projects. If you want to make the world a better place while working with the latest mobile technologies, email Bill at digitaljobs at pbs.org. That's digitaljobs at pbs.org. They're in Arlington, Virginia, but they are willing to consider remote work arrangements. And we thank PBS for sponsoring this episode of the Ray Wenderlich Podcast. I am Alex Sullivan, here with my recently recatted co-host, Drew Freeman. Thanks, Alex. Our guest for this episode is Leah Marolt Sonnenschein. Leia is studying innovation design engineering at the Royal College of Art and Imperial College in London. She writes about iOS, UX, and UI, teaches iOS classes at GA, and volunteers for Girls Who Code. On this episode, Leia will teach us how to put Apple's new Swift UI framework into practice. Then Drew will talk about his mixed feelings over Dark Sky. Leia, welcome to the show. Hello. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. I know we uh, are pulling you in the middle of a, a weekend afternoon, so <laughs> uh, you're in London, right? Yes, yeah, no worries at all. It's great to be on the show, thanks. Yeah, it's, I, admittedly, we are still in the middle of, of COVID shelter, so it's not like <laughs> we were going out and doing lots of things this weekend. Exactly, How prime time you? for podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah, it should, we should do more podcasts now that we're yeah. still outside. S squish them all into... <laughs> <laughs> hopefully limited shelter in place period exactly i'm actually like working with a friend of mine to maybe start a podcast in slovenian um Ooh, cool yeah i know so working on um, that so how many languages do you speak um i well <laughs> depending on the level of fluency i guess like i would say i'm fluent in english slovenian croatian um and then i can speak german italian spanish okay <laughs> enough so so all of them you, you can just say all. well of them. i'm 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 very bad with all all the like eastern east asian languages like none of those <laughs> or african like i know a little bit of swahili but that's just because we were in kenya for my master's program for a little bit and kind of had to figure out how to say some things. You see, and there, here we see the difference between people on the Western continents and the Eastern continents is we tend to have a uh, good fluency in English. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> well, well, I'm from Slovenia, which is a country of 2 million people. Um, so if you speak just Slovenian, you're not really going to be able to communicate with most of the world. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's kind of a necessity. <laughs> I have English, French, uh, a little bit of Japanese. Oh, nice. Yeah, Japanese is I very barely good. got English. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we have Alex on the show as a co-host, so we can teach him more English. Great. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. To so make ourselves feel simple. better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I'm around most rooms, really. <laughs> so how long have you been in London, then? I've been in London for almost two years now. I moved in 2018 from New York. Um, for doing my master's in innovation design engineering. Okay, and you, and so you were living in the States for a while as well? Yeah, I lived in the States for about eight years. Um, I went to college there, and then I worked for um, a company called Rents the Runway in New York for three years. Mm -hmm. And then I got kind of bored, and I was like, oh, let's do some other stuff. <laughs> Which one of them is you volunteer for Girls Who Code? Yeah, well, actually, I did that while I was in New York. Um, mm -hmm. Already, I was um, helping out a high school in Brooklyn um, to develop this like 
club uh, for technically it was sponsored by Girls Who Code, but we also had two boys in it because <laughs> we were <laughs> inclusive and welcoming. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. I'm really glad to see all the efforts that are being put in to get more women in engineering. It's uh, it's been so horribly a male dominated field, mm-hmm. and uh, my female colleagues that I have worked with have usually more than excelled over my talents as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good to have them. We've Alex is actually our first male co-host since oh. I've taken over the show. This is our, our fourth season. Wow. So, but I am so glad to, to see all the efforts that, that start on the, the junior high and high school levels for that. Yeah. Same. I was actually helping out with, um, there was like a, robo gals um at my current schools um where you kind of like build these uh, lego robots sumo bots and they fight each other Um, oh that's awesome (laughs) so you try to like push each other out of the ring uh and the kids build them and like put a bunch of weird stuff on them um but yeah it's quite a cool one as well lego robo sumo yeah (laughs) i love it that's the future right there that's the future exactly now, we spoke before the show that you're you're sort of taking a, a little break from your master's study right now. So what are you doing to, 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 to make up with time or what are you doing to fill time? Yeah, so with all this COVID stuff, things have been a little confusing recently because my, my program is a very hands-on program. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm in the final year where basically we spend the last two semesters working on this solo project. And um, I was working on a project helping blind musicians learn how to play music and integrate with sighted groups. Yeah. So, but it's a, the problem is that um, it's a lot of like physical prototyping and user testing. And like, you have to be in the room to see what's happening and how they're like dealing with all the things that you're trying to prototype with them, (laughs) which is impossible at this moment. (laughs) So I could have kind of, you know, like made a speculative, thesis report or whatever for the next two months but i thought they offered us a leave of absence with no um repercussions for up to a year so i thought it might be better to kind of do that since i've like so far i feel like i've made like a very good network of both blind musicians and like people are interested in doing this research and some professors and i'm just kind of like not really ready to just kind of abandon it and let it go because I feel like the boss just finally started rolling. Um, so that's kind of why I decided to take a leave of absence instead of just, you know, pushing something out to be done with it. Um, so instead I'm currently like, I'm debating a little bit, but currently i um, thinking about taking a role as an iOS developer slash product manager uh, at a company in Slovenia that does, um, mm. uh, they currently have an app for language therapy for kids that are younger, mm. like from one to eight years old, where they basically like, it's kind of like Snapchat, where you like <laughs> see other people doing stuff and sounds, and then you make those sounds, and if you do them right, you get like little like face avatars and stuff. And so kids really like it and like collecting it. Um, and they're working on this new product now. So we've been talking about me joining and kind of taking the lead on that product. And see how that goes. Yeah. It's like a nice opportunity right now because there's a bunch of parents stuck at home with kids. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So they really need something to entertain them. But like, especially if the kids have some sort of like developmental challenges, it's very useful to have a tool that kind of helps you do that now that you can't really access any sort of help. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, coincidence. One of the first apps that I worked on professionally uh, was uh, an edutainment tool. And I always hmm. shiver at that word. Uh, <laughs> it's where it's we're, really awful. Yeah. Where we were basically, uh, <laughs> taking a, uh, a speech pathologist's, method of helping kids who are slow to pick up reading and mm. uh and basically with cards on the table progress from words like from pot we take away the p and we put away uh, we put on an oh. h and now the word is hot oh mm. cool huh uh, yeah nice. i remember it very clearly because the uh the speech pathologist was computer illiterate and i had to learn <laughs> my first job how to translate tech to 
uh, non tech. Non tech, <laughs> and, and it was it was uh, at times it was like okay, so we've been spending times on the algorithm to progress between words in this stacked list, and she'd look at us and go, "Okay, where's the talking <laughs> squirrel?" <laughs> <laughs> So we spent. But where was the talking squirrel? So we spent yeah. about a week just doing a, a talking squirrel, and and I uh, done uh, theater and television in my undergraduate. Oh boy! So I was able to actually do an animation, what's called a dope sheet, which is where you just animate different mouth forms to different vowels. Oh, okay. That's so we cool. recorded somebody with a, a little chipper voice saying, "So let's move the T to the P," and then we <laughs> animated this little. Oh, that's awesome! Uh... And she was like, so that's my talking squirrel. I'll go away for six months. You can keep going. <laughs> yes. I think you got this. I see the talking squirrel. I think you got everything else. <laughs> nice. How did it do, uh, the app? I left the product, uh, the project about 60% of the way through because mm. at that time I was working for a university that was paying, paying me university wages in the late 90s. Mm. And I got hired on on the West Coast for a commercial company, mm. okay. which paid me university wages for the East Coast. <laughs> really not fun. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> but anyway, you have worked with Swift UI. I have, yes. <laughs> and you you have gone through its growing pains. I have indeed gone through its growing pains. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> Can you talk a bit about the project that you took on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess soon after June, after Apple released Swift UI, um, Ray kind of did a call for, hey guys, who's interested in doing like an app for, for the Ray Vanderlich website? basically. Um, and since I've been doing my master's and it's very um, kind of like hands-on and kind of removed from iOS development, I thought it would be a nice opportunity to get back into it, especially because it seemed like um, they were kind of keen on trying out Swift UI as trying to be on the bleeding edge of everything. <laughs> um, so we had an initial call and we kind of like talked about some um, drawbacks, some potential opportunities that we could see here. We had this like grand vision of like, okay, cool, we're gonna do this in Swift UI. It looks amazing. Like we're gonna like document the whole path through, like from the design. Because I was also helping a little bit on like the design um, with Luke, the main designer of the app. So I knew about the app and how it was gonna look like and like kind of uh, behave beforehand, actually. Um, and so the plan was to just create like this amazing course of how to create an app for production basically. And then also have that app in production with the designs and with everything that goes with it um, on GitHub by like the end of September. That was the kind of the of goal. September. So yeah. Now and yeah. Swift and the UI, app. Swift UI released in September. <laughs> Yes, yes, officially it <laughs> went out in September. That was the that was the point. It was like we're gonna be the first app on the App Store with Swift UI when it launches. Now, as we um, we are, we are aware, Swift UI, in a polite term, was not completely baked when it was first <laughs> released to us at WWDC, and went through changes that yes. affected you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Swift UI went through many, many changes throughout in, in the time between June and September. Um, I, yeah, it has, it changed significantly. I still, I was looking before this um, podcast, I was looking at my notes for um, a talk that I did in um, New York for Try Swift. Um, I'm looking at some of the screenshots of the slides, and there's a screenshot of Xcode just being like, a thousand plus errors like <laughs> at an update of Swift UI because the thing was like you, you had to work with a beta of Catalina you had to work with a beta of Xcode and you had to work with like oh Swift goodness. UI so you had like three problems uh, <laughs> happening that were like unstable I, I feel itchy just hearing yeah about that. no no you know I was like I was like 
this is fine. This is fine. We're gonna deal with this. But then, why, why like, am I seeing the like, little dog in the? I'm seeing the little dog with the 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 coffee mug. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. the fire. The fire. This is fine. Yes, that's that's how I felt for most of the summer. I was like, it's fine, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, with every update, it was just like errors, and you were like, oh my god, what happened? And like sometimes it was that Apple would just like like just decide to use a d- different word for something that they were doing. They do right? that a lot. Were they, was, because the, I didn't really follow Swift UI. I, I mean, I played with it at WWDC. Yeah. I was in the middle of doing my own app that had to support 11 and 12. Yeah. So I was like, this is 13. I'll get to it. <laughs> yeah. I'll play with it and it's kind of nifty and I don't understand some of this because I hadn't done any reactive programming. Like, Stop. End I, sentence. I, 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 I was going to say accurate information, but I was like, no, actually, it wasn't like just, accurate just or inaccurate. It was just blank in most cases. Um, so it, it was quite difficult, but I think that that helped them a lot because they didn't need to, you know, update the information, yeah. Yeah. documentation with every release. Like, for example, this was, um, I think at first they made this. So Swift UI works with Combine. Um, seamlessly, let's say. Um, <laughs> and um, the way that you kind of make that work is that you can form this like combiny class that like deals with data stuff um, to something called observable objects. And initially this was called bindable objects and um, they just like flipped it. And I don't think that change was necessarily noted. It was just like in Xcode. It was just like <laughs> nothing conforms to this protocol mm, anymore. And you're yeah. like, what did I do to not conform to this protocol? And you're like, oh my God, I don't know. And it doesn't have that nice feature most of the time. We can just be like, you know, we have the red thing with the dot and you can just be like, fix. It's like, no. <laughs> that, that doesn't, that, There's no didn't fix it button happen. there. Exactly. The fix it button basically says you have incomplete syntax. <laughs> Would you care to, to, yeah, it doesn't say you've used the wrong syntax so we don't use yeah. it anymore because we've gotten that out of the system. Yes, mm. the fix it button is like, Come back to this in three months. So, <laughs> to, how to be determined. Yeah. How useful are the WWDC videos going to be mm. with everything having changed? So, I think like the core philosophy of the videos before they get into actual code are still pretty useful, but the the actual code of the video, like the actual code that you can download, got obsolete fairly quickly. And at this point, where we are now, I I actually just talked to Sam Davis who. Um, took over the like final stretches of making the app, um, mm-hmm. the Raven on the Jab, uh, yesterday, and yeah, he was telling me that basically the Swift UI, <laughs> the Swift UI videos from WWDC from last year are kind of just completely garbage. Even though that's like the only documentation <laughs> that Apple that Apple actually gives you about how this works. So I think like the philosophy around what it means to kind of work within the declarative framework versus an imperative framework is still there. Um, but I guess that's not the part that was really that new or like that's, that's been explored and that's been kind of explained through other frameworks. Um, but it like, like the beginnings before you get into the nitty gritty of the code are, I think are still valuable to look at some people who aren't used to this. Like the philosophy that they that goes behind it, yeah. that still has some value. Yeah. But the details, yeah, maybe exactly. not so much. Implementation is like, meh. I see. So that makes sense. I think one of the things that, that slowed me down from adopting Swift UI after WWDC was going to the sessions, and everything was delivered in boxes. And what I mean by that is the Swift UI talked about Swift UI, but not necessarily how to connect it to anything else. <laughs> yeah. And Combine was the same way. And I, I've talked about this on the shows that the Combine videos and the Combine sessions were all about Combine, but not necessarily how to connect it to anything else. Yeah, absolutely. That that was definitely one of the struggles because a lot of the examples that they gave were extremely simplistic. Like they have this beautiful mm. like tutorial, like they, they came up with a lot of like really well done tutorials on like apple.com to be able to learn and they have great visualizations and they have lots of code um and they show you like how to make table views and everything is perfect and great and you see that and you're like amazing um (laughs) but like once you kind of have to go beyond this like toy app of data flow (laughs) basically 
uh, it gets quite tricky. And the examples that they were giving us seemed like they weren't really following the correct conventions that they oh. set forth where they were like, basically the idea in this is that you have this unidir unidirectional data flow where like the parent owns the state and the main like bits of data and then it like trickles down and then the children kind of change their something state and then like that propagates up there. But like they never like actually manipulate the data itself. It's just like they communicate the change back. Whereas like imagine this was, for example, in one of the tutorials that just like confused me to no end was that you had a table view and the table view obviously like had the data of the, all the cells. And then once you clicked on the cell, it displayed like that item for the cell. But then once you did something on that cell, it was supposed to like tell back to the parent what was going on. And, but the thing was that it also had to send its index backwards mm -hmm. so it needed to like know what it was in order to like tell the parent uh -huh. what to change and that just seems completely unintuitive because there was no way to like with table views and lists like to propagate these changes and connect them properly together so you had to connect them through these like neanderthal means of like passing <laughs> down indices of things it's like what why am i doing this, this is not okay <laughs> like i should not know the fact that i am Number three, I should just know that I am bro, right? Mm. Um, so it was like, kind of like, okay, you're giving me this example, but like, even in this simple example, you have to resort to some weird means of communicating between oh. the states. Like, how am I actually going to do that in a more complicated example where I need this like data object to be like between multiple view controllers or like multiple views, I guess, uh, displaying and other like lots of things are making changes to it. So like, how does this work at scale was definitely an unresolved question that I think is still not really resolved well, because I think people are trying out different possibilities and versions, but you know, it, it's, it's like, you feel like you can accomplish what you need to accomplish, but it, like there's like a feeling of there seems to be something wrong with this. Like it feels like you're still there's, doing some sort of hacks. Yeah, like like some piece is missing between yeah. everything. Like there's some something should be here that's not there. Yeah, exactly. That's how all of Android development feels all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, we've talked about this on some of the Android shows with the technologies. One of the things that they really didn't talk about was the design patterns that work best with Swift UI. I, mm. they, obviously, the phrase source of truth was thrown around countlessly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that doesn't necessarily say, well, how does this connect to a model? How does this connect mm. since this seems to almost become a controllerless world? Yeah, absolutely. And it's like oddly veering towards singletons as like, how you're supposed to do things, even though that was something to be avoided of <laughs> before. Back. Yeah, I know. It's like, there's like, some parts are going backwards, some parts are going forwards. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the, the UI part of Swift UI is incredible and amazing. And it's like so snappy and like, you love it. <laughs> and like, that was, that was so good. Like it's, yeah, I really enjoyed that part. But when you had to like deal with the data flow, I, it was, it was confusing um in order to, like it was confusing how to best make it work so that it's still manageable for you as a developer but also that it actually works <laughs> all of the things manageable yeah <laughs> works <laughs> yeah yeah it's beautiful code it doesn't work but it's beautiful yeah. code. Oh, it does. oh this doesn't compile <laughs> but i left it in a pristine state <laughs> <laughs> exactly so you talked about the UI, and when you were doing Swift UI UI, that it was uh, that beautiful Apple word <laughs> snappy. Um, yes. <laughs> did you wind up making any custom controls? Because I know that at the core of Swift UI is let's make you know here are all our, our squares and triangles and lines, and you don't need yeah, yeah. curves. Um, yeah, I we definitely like ended up making a couple of custom controls. One of the things that I was questioning initially 
because there was not that much precedent at the time since like we were all flying blind when we started. Um, I think there's a lot more resources in this now, but it was like, how do you create reusable things in this world of everything being connected and bound to each other? Like, how do you properly bind things, but That's also make more of the same thing? So like if you have a checkbox or like a button, um, how how will you make a, a reusable component? Because that's like one of the things that you do in UI kit. And some of the, for example, some of the like not view controller but views. Uh, if you just you could just write them like very purely with no custom things, um, but then they would end up being like insane spaghetti code because yeah. you apply so many modifiers to these structs of yeah, views. Yeah, the modifiers. That yeah, it just gets it gets a little unruly if you're trying to create something um, if you're complex. So you really like need to be careful to abstract uh, certain parts, like abstract a lot of the parts into their own views or structs or like classes. Um, and sometimes the better way is to do like a whole struct view as a not not a class, but like as a separate file, I guess. Um, and sometimes it's better as a view modifier. So like maybe you just want to apply a certain styling to a font or a, I mean like a piece of text uh, or a button or something like that. Um, so we ended up using a lot of um, like a lot of um, separate structs with like enum driven. Um, Interesting. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, styling for like buttons. I know there was like error buttons and like active buttons mm -hmm. and primary buttons, secondary buttons and stuff like that. Um, so I think those were all like kind of custom structs with um, a bunch of enum definitions, but for um, some layout things or text, uh, there were a lot of new modifiers. Um, and yeah, a lot of things were also kind of missing from <laughs> the UI library. Um, so you kind of have to recreate them. For example, this was a really silly one, but um, like you could have, you didn't have a search bar, right? And that's fine because you could like replace it with a text field. But then when you're normally interacting with a search bar, you can like have the little X button <laughs> that mm -hmm. it, like clears out the field. So there was no way to have this X button happen in this text field, <laughs> right? And so basically we ended up writing a view modifier that would just add this button <laughs> on top of a text field. Interesting. Which is kind of like a weird way to think about quirky. this. <laughs> yeah, it's a quirky for sure. Yeah. Um, I guess you'd expect that if Swift UI was up to par with Swift, uh, with UI kit, yeah. that they would ha have one-to-one. -one yeah, they would yeah. have all the components, yeah. yeah. Because, uh, I guess that's the whole, I mean, like, <laughs> you think about how long it took for UI kit to evolve to where it is now, and like, how are, how are they gonna get there? So quickly with Swift UI, it feels like it'll take them time to build up the, the repository. Well, of one of the things that we exactly. always talk about with, uh, with younger teams uh, is don't try to replicate the system UI elements because mm -hmm. if the system changes those UI elements in a new rev of the software, yeah. you won't have your elements update so they'll look completely different and as a result, you know, you, yes, you can have your Swift UI app living in its own world, but it's still going to feel slightly different. It, it was, uh, yeah. was it OS, was it seven when they pulled Scoomorphism yeah. out entirely? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and everything the became entire, flat. The yeah. entire <laughs> iOS UI world changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. I remember doing rewrites around that and finding this Frankenstein app that had half of its stuff flat now and half of it at all its elevation and texture. Ah, yeah, I think I came into like iOS 11 right at that transition into flat UI, so I didn't have to deal with that. Um, yeah. And after like Arc was a thing, <laughs> so good But for did me. you have to go through the Swift 2 to Swift 3 transition? I, I did, and Swift wasn't Swift didn't exist yet when I started. So I still like learned basically Objective C. I was actually at WWDC when they announced Swift, and um, I was so mad. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I finally I learned <laughs> this Objective-C crap 
and with all the apps and like you know brackets and stuff and i get it and now you're pulling the rug <laughs> under my feet and giving me swift ui screw you apple <laughs> like, <laughs> i'm just like not okay <laughs> But anyway. I, mean, I, 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 I was on Objective C since the introduction of OS X. Yeah. And and I went through those 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 uh, learning bumps with that language because <laughs> it wasn't really something that made sense unless you really got into it. Mm. But I was I mean I wasn't thrilled that they introduced a new language. But once I started using Swift. I converted over to it, and now I find Objective C a pain in the butt that I can't remember when to put a set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. I like very soon after Swift was like actually stable and released, I was like on board with it, um, and like I pushed for when I started working at Venter Runway, like the app was entirely Objective C, and mm -hmm. then I was like two months in, I was like, hello, boss. <laughs> how about we do these new things that we have to do in Swift and see how that goes? And it was a bit of a pain in the butt because, you know, the, there was like that whole bridging issue that wasn't really clear oh, at yeah. that point yet. This was like 2015. Um, way but, back when. Oh, I know, way, way back years. when. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but like ultimately, you know, I think by the time I left, we had about like 80% of the app in Swift. So. Well, I mean, yeah, and, and it wasn't until this past year that you really could put everything in Swift because there was mm. the, uh, as I always talk about the stable ABIs, having the, the binary interface, the binary libraries, once that got stabilized, now you could do your own frameworks. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. cool. So I have, a, I have a question on, you mentioned using modifiers to build up some of those like custom views. Mm -hmm. I played around with Swift UI really briefly. And one thing that I found kind of confusing was like, if I did dot padding, some number dot padding, another, another number dot yeah. padding again, what, what is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> so did you ever, did you ever run into any issues with that? Like with not being sure what state you were in or what order modifiers have gone in or anything oh, like that? Oh yeah. It took me a while to actually understand that like the order does matter. Cause I was like, I was just like doing it, you know, not really thinking about it because that's how, you know, all the documentations were done. And then at some point like things weren't working. I was like, why? So I was like, okay, time to like dig deep into this. And yeah, it's kind of weird, but, um, each modifier basically creates a new object of the struct. So whatever you apply to it is like a new thing. So you can apply as many paddings as you want to, like in sequence, and it's going to change things. And you can like change the background at the point of the padding, which is a different view. And then you have another view and another view. So it's like you really you kind of need to think about how like the order in which you apply the modifiers, because sometimes actually like some modifiers won't be able to be applied to something that's let's say like a text field because you've changed it to like a normal view or you've changed it uh, to something else like an image um through one of the modifiers so then you have to be like ah at this point you're still an image <laughs> so here i can like apply some filters to you but now you're something else um so it's like it's not it's definitely not like an intuitive way to think about ui because you're like this is a image or like this is a button but like actually <laughs> at the end it's no longer a button um it's like a t totally different thing so it's like it takes it takes a little while to get used to that so you, you talked about looking at the code and, and saying you wound up with frankenstein code because you weren't sure of all the things that you'd put together what would you say was like the most bizarre thing you had to do to make the app work <laughs> Ah, uh, just just there? one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay, this is actually like I think one of the most bizarre, just because it was su it seemed like such a simple thing to like do conceptually, but it took me I think like a month to figure out how to do it well. Um, was to implement like callbacks on check marks uh, in this like filtering control because you couldn't which is what I was talking about before like propagating changes and having reusable components um, there was no way to like communicate back and forth 
uh, between like this library view and this filtering view and also have because this filtering view relied on like you tapping on this check mark and basically we're going to use this check mark in some other parts of the app so as a check mark you should be like on or off right and it shouldn't matter exactly what you're toggling on or off as long as we know that you're on or off but once you put those in a list they kind of get decoupled from the data that they are bound to so in like I tried out a whole bunch of like different ways of binding things together and in the end we ended up using callbacks um, like you would um, in UI kit sometimes right now instead of like using a delegate because there was just no way to <laughs> make these check marks oh, work yeah. in multiple screens even though they were the same <laughs> component i mean even like they looked the same but we could have done like multiple of these check marks that were the same but like through <laughs> um and uh, reacting with different objects or we could like go with callbacks so we decided to do that because we figured that this would probably be an issue that was going to be addressed at some point because there's no way that like you'll you're, you're just going to lose the trace of binding between like a table of use data and it's um, kind of children but it is kind of a tricky one because a table like a table views data source or I guess a lists data source does update so like what exactly is bound and do the bound things update so it's for sure a tricky question <laughs> to answer but there needs to be a better solution than just kind of like well you know you everyone needs to know about itself and backwards again so I think that was the weirdest thing one one thing that is now biting us <laughs> um, is the fact that there were a whole bunch of like little tiny hacks that we had to do like <laughs> how to color like some things were so so simple um, like just setting up a table view or like a fake collection view technically it's a scroll view that just like scrolls uh, <laughs> horizontally but some things were really hard, like extending the color of the background throughout the whole screen, for example, or like background colors of table views, or like really silly things like that, or like if the big titles will turn into small titles. Um, like that was actually like a view modifier issue where like you had to do it in a specific sequence in order to get the title to become smaller because at some point you didn't consider it a title of a screen anymore. Um, but wow. <laughs> yeah, but some of the some of the little hacks that we did, like um, in UI Kit Code, we like globally changed background colors for table views, or like separator colors, for example, and changed like insets um, of the UI. And now in iOS thirteen point four, these things have been fixed the way they were supposed to be. <laughs> So it's breaking. <laughs> They're like, eh. never um, leverage so, a bug. Never, you know, never leverage a bug. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was yeah, it was an interesting path of like knowing what's a bug, what's a feature, how it's supposed to work. And now I think is the time where we're actually learning how things were meant to be and they're starting to make more sense. <laughs> so I know with Swift UI you can cheat. And that mm. cheat being you can use UI kit. Yes. <laughs> did you wind up falling back on UI kit for anything? Yes, we did. Um, for two things. Um, one was the UI activity indicator um, because it was really easy to kind of just like wrap it um, <laughs> in a representable object and put it on and like have it spin and like making animations work in Swift UI was not something you really wanted to do. Um, <laughs> and the other thing was um, the video controller. Mm. Um, because we wanted to use the built-in um, video player, basically. And there was no real options to like have playback controls unless we wanted to roll our own. And even in that case, we would have had to like fall back to um, some of the, like, um, mechanisms that we could get to in UI kit um, so that like player view controller is entirely in UI kit yeah there's always that uh, that transition over time where um, I remember back when there was carbon and then there was cocoa and cocoa was written in carbon and then eventually it evolved that 
that Cardinal was written in Coco and then there was Objective <laughs> C and Swift was written in Objective C. No, actually Swift was always written in Swift. Uh -huh. The question is, when will the API set all be written in Swift UI rather than yeah. just UI kit? And there's always that transition. So, you know, we can probably expect in WWDC virtual, mm -hmm. uh, virtual 20, that um, yes. we, we can expect that there will probably be an evolution to uh, Swift UI that will uh, show us yeah. the more you do. So that leads me to my favorite question. You've talked about things that maybe don't work yet or that you'd <laughs> like to see. Let's assume that we've got Apple engineers listening in, and this is your chance to say, here's my wish list. So yes. what's your wish list for Swift UI 2? What is my wish list? Um, I wish one, one huge struggle, actually, was figuring out how to deal with modals, like modal views that come up instead of like, you know, going into a navigation stack. Like that whole idea of like a navigation controller is now obsolete because you don't have navigation controls, you just have like navigation views that like right. trickle somewhere and then you have like this modal view. And that thing kept on changing so dramatically from one release to the next one that there and there was no consensus and it actually didn't work well either because um we we in our designs we had a lot of um modal views happening initially instead of like everything being in a navigation stack um but we had to revert back because the data passing was wrong like like if you we wanted basically like the way that the app works right now is that you have um, you can, as a subscriber, you can see all the video courses that we publish on Raven Village, um, and you can watch them. So you have like a list, like a like a table view of all the videos in the library view. You can search through or filter, and then you tap on it, and it takes you to details about that video or course or whatever. Uh, and we wanted to have that in a modal because it makes more sense and you can like easily dismiss it and whatnot. But like the data passing to that modal um, like worked for the first time. So like the first time it showed you the right thing and every subsequent time it would show you the previous thing. Mm -hmm. And I was actually talking to some Apple engineers about that and they were like, oh, it should work. And I gave them like the simplest, like I gave them the simplest code that was just like a list of numbers and you would tap it and it would like pop up with the, the number. So like it was just passing text through, nothing like crazy like video IDs and whatever, JSON and whatnot. And it didn't work in that example. And I still have that code on GitHub. And I sent it to <laughs> one of the Apple engineers. They were like, yeah, yeah, just send me the code. I'll look through it. And then I got no replies <laughs> <laughs> like, well. for months. And I was like, well, okay, then I guess we'll just change the way that we wanted to have this done. But that, that, that was so frustrating. And I wish that they would like be very explicit about how to handle these interactions and how the data flow works under the hood so that you can like identify what you could be doing wrong because like you literally couldn't you could just fly blind try to <laughs> pass a whole bunch of things because if you were like following this in code it seemed like, like it should have been doing the right thing like the objects that were being passed through were correct um but in the ui things didn't change or like on an update of the ui things reverted back so that was another like confusing thing like what exactly does trigger the ui update because now you have this black box layer that you, you can't really access so that's another thing that i really would love to have like better understanding and how things work rather than what they do um because it's it, it's quite difficult to debug uh, error messages that give you UI kit references yeah. <laughs> when you don't have UI kit objects. Um, so yeah, that that was. I hope yeah. that they do a little more on that and maybe like come up with some new ways of debugging code because I, like I feel like the sequential way of like looking at a stack or like what function is called is kind of not necessarily the best in this world where like everything is reacting at the same time. So it might be nice to like 
see something more holistically like this thing changed and it affected these things <laughs> together so like if you want to trace like one path like you can go down that path or another path but like it would be nice to see like a different way of displaying um how the code really works uh behind the scenes that would be super useful and also in the view debugger i think <laughs> it would be nice if they would refer to things better like you can go down from swift ui ui stuff to like ui kit stuff but the transition is confusing because there are some objects that you don't have access to ever and you can't like really make them so you don't know how they act so a little a little more in the debugging tools would be amazing i think my two big wish list items are one i want parity with ui kit <laughs> yeah okay yeah i, I, I want <laughs> uh, there, there are elements that you know have become staples of apple or ios style engineering that in swift ui they're just not there the search bar is a great example mm -hmm. the other one or is collection I, views or i don't think they're view. yeah there. <laughs> definitely or, and the the second one which is a bigger wish and probably not as likely is swift is open source i'd love mm. to see swift ui go open source yeah that would be nice i mean because now that would be so the ability cool. to to submit Debug. ideas i mean it, it would just be, it, but i mean ui becomes really ios is bread and butter so yeah. you know, whether or not that goes public i don't i don't really know that's yeah that's a good that would be amazing if it happened um i thought of one more thing I guess it's still in the debugging world, but error it's, messages. <laughs> it's your shopping list. <laughs> if, if, if they could just give us like sensible error messages that were like where the errors would pop up at the right line where there's actually a problem, <laughs> that would be super great. Cause like, too I much. Think, you ask for too much. <laughs> <laughs> My God. I think I, for like the entire time that we spent developing, like one of the biggest like time sucks was the fact that something would just like give you, and I'm big, like, blah, blah, is ambiguous in type lookup in this context. And it's like, that makes no what sense. does this mean? And also, it was m m most of the time, it was like totally like highlighting a line that wasn't even the problem. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> you kind of like had to like, understand the program, like, like intuit what it actually meant by getting used to like what it complains about. And it like, it really wasn't very clear. Uh, so th there was so much of me going like, all right, I'm going to comment out this line. I'm going to comment out <laughs> this line and this line. Okay, which line is actually the one that's causing the problem? <laughs> um, yeah, you can't ask yeah. too much here. This, I, I mean, take a look at me. I know, I'm, Santa, I'm Santa code clause here. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me yeah. everything. You still might get a lump of coal in... in, in uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I liked your comment before about how the Apple engineer said it should work. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you gave him a small example, there was no response, which I, I have to, I, I, I talked to Alex about this. I'm wearing a shirt today that says six stages of debugging. And those stages consist of one, that can't happen. <laughs> two, that doesn't happen on my machine. <laughs> three, that shouldn't happen. Uh -huh. Four, why does that happen? Uh -huh. Five, <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> and of course, six. Why did that ever work? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, and I really, like those. I, I get the impression in Swift UI we're really dealing with that at this point. It's still very young. It's it's. I mean, it's barely yeah. a year old. So yeah, it's still on Purina Swift UI kit kitten chow. So exactly. I and like I think one like like taking a step back from the you know day to day of trying to work with it and being frustrated with it, I still think it's like an amazing thing um, that they did, and I think it's going to be great very soon. I think we were just a little too ambitious to start with um, to just think that it's going to work just because the examples look so cool. Um, and just kind of had faith where like, I think we all knew in the back of our minds that like that was not going to be possible because we know betas, they will be betas. And you were working with, as I said, like three betas. So like 
the possibility of success was dramatically low um, <laughs> on that timeline. Um, but I still think like it has such great promise um, in like how how to how to think about code and how to develop yeah. it and how to make UI and like I'm still really excited about it and um, I just think we need a little more guidance from Apple in how they've used it in slightly larger scale examples. Yeah. That the question is whether or not they have used it in larger scales at this point. Yeah. I mean, one exactly. of the comments that, uh, that we made earlier in the season, one of our guests said, you know, combine, combine. <laughs> one of our guests said combine was yeah. really good. It was about 80, 85% baked and in, in really good shape. And mm -hmm. the question was, did Swift UI get pushed out there so that there was something to demonstrate with? <laughs> Interesting. Um, huh. And we'll never, we'll never know because, you know, internal to Apple, it's like, you know, we have a goal to get this out there. And then you know, I think we'll get a much clearer picture at WWDC virtual uh, this mm. year. That That's a very good point because I feel like, if there, like, Swift UI was definitely like the more accessible and shinier thing that you know, people yeah. could just be like, Ehh. and then they kind of had to use combine or like aspects yeah. of combine. Um, so that's that's a very that would have been really tricky, but I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> what a smart comment! That was some fantastic information, Leah. Thank you so much, um, Drew. I heard that you had some interesting feelings about Dark Sky, and I'd love to hear about them. So I, I have been around the term Sherlocking since <laughs> the original Sherlock search tool got pretty much pulled into Apple's OS. Um, uh. But I really haven't personally dealt with the loss of anything severely. Um, I, I guess test flight was one of the ones that I had used that got bought by Apple. It didn't get Sherlock. And the latest thing that Apple has picked up is an API set called Dark Sky. And Dark Sky is an interface into weather information. You basically call Dark Sky and you get an amazing JSON block of data that includes humidity, pressure, temperature, um, seven day forecasts, et cetera. And I use Dark Sky very actively in the app that I released this past year. Uh, and you get that letter that says, hi, we're joining the Apple family. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and they then go on to say, well, don't worry. The, the Dark Sky <laughs> API will continue to be there through the end of 2021. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, oh, so I should worry. <laughs> and, yeah, it, it really means that, that well, there's definitely going to be an update to my app. And what do I do? And hopefully at WWDC 2020 virtual, they will, they you will, love uh, that word, huh? I love that. Just, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've been to 16 WWDCs in my career. Wow. And, I, and I'm, and I'm only 22. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but you know, I, I hope that they'll announce something this year, but uh, I think it's too soon for them to, uh, because this information from Dark Sky came out maybe a month ago. Mm. Now, yeah, probably a lot of stuff has been set up in the, in the meantime, and there was all that negotiation and business and all of that, but usually you get that announcement when they're basically, when the deal is done. Not necessarily when the incorporation of the technology has occurred. I mean, yeah. a large company adopts a technology in about two, two and a half years. So is 2021 soon enough for me to have an API from Apple? And really, would Apple get into that kind of service? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think they'll actually offer the API? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I suppose I suppose there could be weather kit next to location. <laughs> yeah, I guess, sure. I guess so. But it just seems to be getting further away. I mean, sure, if I imagine things, you know, we, we talk about everything they're doing with AR and the whole concept of how far can you take AR. 
Yeah. But, you know, weather isn't something you necessarily look at. And if you do look at the immediate weather around you, it's three or four facts and that's it. I mean, I guess if you wanted to, like, connect with family abroad and see the weather yeah, that they're seeing in front of just, you. <laughs> I don't know. So, so yeah, I, I'm, I, I wish I were more excited about this. Um, <laughs> yeah, really, like I said in, in the, like you said in the intro, I, I have mixed feelings because I'm thrilled that a small company is now under Apple's umbrella. Yeah. I mean... Apple is a fantastic place to work for, from what I've been told. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and I'm thrilled to see a technology not get pushed out of the way. But at the same time, from a consumer of that technology, um, there is that general fear, because I know that I'm not going to be able to write the people at Dark Sky and say, well, what's going to happen to me after yeah. 2021? Because they will be well, that's Apple's future plans. We can't tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Have either of you had a, a technology subsumed by either Google or Apple? Yeah. I, I, well, this was back in college, but I was so mad when Facebook bought Parse, which was, I think, mm -hmm. one of the first, like, database as a service type things. Mm -hmm. It made it really easy to just kind of, like, for anyone who wasn't a back-end engineer to be like, all right. I can have like a backend now super easily and maintain it and manage it. And so like in college, like we did a lot of like little like apps um, and we had like a group and stuff and a lot of them depended on parse. Um, and I, yeah, I remember like Facebook got it. They maintained it for like maybe a year and then they were like, we're going to sunset this. Bye bye. It was great, but sorry. Um, yeah, Google seems to be doing better at not sunsetting technologies. For a while, Google would introduce big technologies and they would just die. Yeah. I mean, I remember yeah. Google's the Google Reader. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I or the what that Google Plus. Was. Google Plus. Yeah, I was like, what was it? Like Google Groups? There was something. Oh, yeah. yeah, Google I remember Plus. That was gonna be that was gonna be the big new thing until nobody then, used it. Then there was that, that yeah. Google Collaborative Social Network thing. I yeah, Google Plus. Was Oh, was that, huh? that was Google Plus? I thought there was a different one. There, there might have been another one. I don't know. <laughs> there probably was. <laughs> They've had like 10 messaging clients at this point. So. I'm, I'm super happy about Google actually like maintaining Firebase and yes, integrating Crashlytics. Firebase, like, yeah. Crashlytics, Fastlane. Yes. Fastlane. yes. Wait, Fastlane, does, does really Google own it. Fastlane? Yeah. They, they got I it. didn't know that. Well, Alphabet. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> And like I think some design tool like Figma or oh, one of well, them. Cool. But the thing is, so um, far they haven't been sunset, which is yeah. a good thing. I mean, I think I think we're past the point where you have things like AOL buying ICQ to kill it. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, past it's that, too that that level. I think yeah. Google does a good job of not killing the companies that they buy. <laughs> they kill off their own products all the time, but I haven't yeah. seen them really like. Buy or if not, one of the things that I feel like Apple does is they don't necessarily kill off products, but they say, "Yeah, this is for us now," and they cut yeah, off. Yeah, everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have hope. It's like, why would you? Why would you even buy a weather service? Yeah. If you're in, but <laughs> it's, it's confusing. The few, Maybe the they're trying to do some hardware with weather. I don't know. Yeah. Man. Maybe they're trying to actually reach the clouds. Maybe that's what this <laughs> cloud strategy. Whole, whole new meaning to cloud computation. <laughs> Your phone just makes a little cloud around it. It's the ultimate in privacy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's a good place to say that. Really, I really want to thank you for being on the show this week. It's uh, it, It's just been a pleasure speaking with you on on this uh, I, we often are diving into the hard tech but this is wonderful to be able to to take a step back and say well what's the implementation like and I really mm -hmm. want to thank yeah. you definitely absolutely yeah it's been a pleasure to talk about this it's been a while since I um, was actually like deep into this like I ran a workshop right after I was doing the app and like I did the keynote speaking and like I was really into it and I was both like really like passionate on what is bad and what is not bad and like now taking like having taken a bit of a break from um, Swift UI it's 
kind of nice to look back on it and see how it's evolved since and like how yeah how like you have more perspective now and i have more perspective and i'm very excited about swift ui <laughs> it was, it was been an absolute pleasure and i i'm probably still not going to dive into swift ui until this year's <laughs> good this idea year's, uh, <laughs> Leia can be found online at Twitter at Hello Sunshine. That's H-E-L-L-O-S-U-N-S-C-H-E-I-N. Correct. I got that one right. <laughs> Alex and I can be found on Twitter sometimes. Alex, Alex Sullivan, 444. I am Podcast Drew, D-R-U. Our next episode, we flip back to the Android world. We're going to have Victoria Gonda on to talk about test-driven development on the Android. And then the show two weeks after that, we go back to iOS, we'll have Andy Pereira on, and we're gonna talk about that magical catalyst technology that lets you throw iOS onto the Mac, sometimes. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> I wanna thank everybody for tuning in. We will be back again in two weeks. In the meantime, we send it back to the Emerald Castle. Ray, back to you. And that's a wrap. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the RayWendelk.com podcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and don't forget to leave a rating on iTunes. See you next time. I <laughs> I love the Ray. Back to you. <laughs> um, how old? How old is that Ray thing? Um. Oh, you mean the recording of Ray? Yeah. With that's a wrap. I yeah. think that goes back to like the beginning of the show, like seven or eight years ago. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I actually have to have him re-record it because what I get is about twenty seconds of music and him then jumping in and he ducks <laughs> the audio really hard, so you hear like da 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 da. Oh. And that's. A wrap. <laughs> And uh, Love it. I want to have him re-record that because I uh, I had him re-record the beginning without music, and I have the the full the full audio. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's great. It's it, it was really funny about two three years ago at the last uh, RW Con, the staff from the con went on a boat trip, and we were basically passing the mic around. Mm. introducing ourselves and it turns out i was standing next to ray and i got the mic last oh so i was like yeah i do the podcast and everything else 
Ray, <laughs> back to you. And I came back. <laughs> it, nice. just, it just worked out that way. Perfect. That is surreal. <laughs> That's I so think cool. at that point he went, and that's a wrap. So I'm to go home. But uh, I, I love working with Ray. He is just a great guy. I uh, I went to my first RW Dev Con, and I fell in love with, with all things Ray. I, I am <laughs> truly a fanboy. Um, and I, I told him right then and there, I would love to get involved with anything. And then about six months later, he said he was looking for somebody to pick up the podcast again. And I... I sent him a note and he, he basically said, I was so happy you, you'd write me in. That's probably oh, stuff so I should nice. edit. We probably Aww. should edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> that's but, typical. No, it's adorable. <laughs> but, exactly. Uh, so I've been doing the podcast now for about three years. Uh, we, we've got our fourth season under our belt. And it's been, it's been great. Last season yeah. I got to have a wish list of, of like, Notoriety and people with notoriety in the field. We had, yeah. we had like a, a Swift with Sundell on, and that was, ah, that was great. very cool. Yeah. yeah, plug all the other past episodes. Go, go back and watch our episodes. Exactly. <laughs> go, go listen to our past episodes because even the ones before me, they're great episodes. Because yeah, uh, one of the goals of the show is you know I want people to walk away going, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, something for sure. Great. What what is is that a 3D gear thing that you That is, yes. That is a 3D gear thing that I have. Um, mm -hmm. I it mean, uh, actually. 3D, print, 3D printed? Yes, it is 3D printed. I'll show you what Ooh, it is. Fancy. Like, you kind of spin it around, and at some point, it's going to make a little more sense. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my, my boyfriend. Um, Printed it for me a little while ago. Now I have my table as a toy. Yeah, that's, um, that's some adorable stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I've seen. I didn't. I didn't mean is it a three D object? I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a three D printed. Like thing. a three D printed. Uh, yeah. Uh, I like the question. Is it a three D object? Does that have depth <laughs> along with width and height? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Violated yeah, physics. This is two D. If I turn it around, there's nothing there. <laughs> yeah, that would be quite amazing. Like the illusion on be. this thing. Just, if that just was casually the case. brought it up too. Yeah. I um, physics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I just, I think it's like a nervous tick now. I just like kind of spin it around like it's on my desk. Um, yeah, since we've been quarantined here, um, my, my master's course deals a lot with like physical making and like 3D printing and laser cutting and silicone Ooh. molding and whatever, like all sorts of these things and using lathes and tools that Ooh. I've never seen before. So now awesome. we kind of... Yeah, we've set up a little bit of a workshop here. So we have a 3D printer and we have a vacuum former and we have nice. a soldering station. Um, so we've you know, been doing... your own little tech shop there. That's yeah, nice. we've been doing lots of like DIY stuff here for the house. Like, awesome. I live with seven other people. It's quite amazing that I've gotten them all to be like quiet for this period of time. <laughs> okay, so you've, um, got, you've got seven people there and yeah. the house with you. Well, eight I, I together with me. Eight. I am blown away because I have heard like no yeah. noise whatsoever. Yeah, same. Yeah, <laughs> no. uh, yeah they're, they're very sitting considerate. Off to the side, like let's get exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Once I come out of there, well, I did do like a little wholesome activity today to make everyone happy. We did like egg dyeing with like natural oh. dyes of oh. onion and cabbage and stuff like that for. Ooh fake easter because none of us are really religious but we're like let's do some fun activities because we're all um, trapped inside you don't have to be religious mm. to have fun with coloring eggs yeah, yeah. exactly exactly um yeah so I, it's actually kind of a blessing to be trapped in with at, like this many people because you're not trapped in with very oh, few yeah. people um and you're not alone which would also suck so yeah, yeah, it's been really nice, actually. Yeah, I'm sheltering with my wife and my, my son. Mm. Um, and uh, it really, it, it wasn't much of a jarring experience for us because I'm working remotely. I've been working remotely yeah. since, uh, since December. And, you know, I, I went to on board with this company for about two weeks in January in Chicago. Mm -hmm. But then I came back and I've been working remotely. My wife is an artist. Okay. So she basically puts uh, beads and wire together and makes these very complex trees and, and brooches and things like that. 
And my son, on the other hand, while he's 13, he's being cyber schooled. Okay. Oh, it's, cool. got, it's, it's like something out of Ready Player One. It's just yeah. bizarre because, you know, what we're doing here is what he does for class. You know, his teacher's up in one corner and the blackboard's up in another corner. And it's just like, I sit there going, why wasn't this available when I was a kid? I would have done so much better in school. Yeah. <laughs> they're, like, I think the UK government um, recently published this initiative that they're trying to invest like 20 million pounds into remote teaching tools where like wow. the classroom would kind of integrate into the dining room experience. So um, I think that like this is the time where we push these like e-learning technologies that everyone's kind of been like not really you know accepting yeah. necessarily to the next level because everyone sees like okay they're not like super ready but like we do need to think about this very extensively so like let's make some great experiences for not just like people who are doing Coursera or MOOCs like let's really legitimize this type of Mm -hmm. learning um well most most of the schools here are now currently using google classroom which mm -hmm. I, I will tell you from my personal experience on it google is probably shopping for something to sunset classroom with <laughs> um classroom is a little on the clunky side how about that i haven't i didn't even know that google had the product called google classroom so yeah well it's Google. They have products for everything. Yeah, fair enough. They sure do. I mean, fair somewhere enough. somewhere there's Google Armpit, and we don't know what it's for, <laughs> but it's there. Go, yes. go Google it. You'll <laughs> Google it. <laughs> Google Armpit. <laughs> I was actually going to Google Google Classroom to look it up later because I'm curious to see what this looks like. Um, someone was telling me that what Google was called before it was called Google I, I need to run a pub quiz apparently next week, on Wednesday <laughs> at some point. So I'm like trying to collect random facts. So if you guys have any, um, feel free. <laughs> well, you could always ask about Lycos, which was the Lycos was a search engine that was competing with Google. Oh. L y l y c o s. L y c o s. Great. Oh yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Catch me on a, on Slack or somewhere if you want. Okay. Useless. I feel like you're full of random facts. I am. <laughs> I am truly full of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds mean. No, I feel like you just have a lot of interesting knowledge that not many people have. Uh, if you go back to season seven mm -hmm. on the show... Uh, I had Mark Dalrymple on around Christmas time, and we basically did a show that was two old Apple geeks reminiscing about what it used to be like to program on Apple. This was <laughs> oh, that's pre, awesome. <laughs> this was pre-OS 10. Oh, mm. exciting. I don't that. <laughs> no, no, you know, that was the perfect reaction. That, that's, that's the Ooh, perfect exciting. Because it, yeah. it, it was all in Pascal, and it was all uh -huh. uh, uh, event uh -huh. loop driven. Interesting. Yeah, but, uh, uh, Alex, how are you doing, by the way, with the shelter in place? You're alone? You live with yeah. people? Uh, no, I live with my wife, so I have one other person, which is very all nice. Right. If I Good. didn't, I'd be... I think I'd be clawing my eyes out, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been mostly fine. I also started a remote job uh, about two weeks before the pandemic hit. <laughs> oh my God. So this is, it's kind of, I mean, in a, you know, it's a little ridiculous, but like there's a certain blessing aspect because as everyone else is learning how to work remotely, I get to, to mm -hmm. leech off of that and be like, oh exactly. yeah, yeah, good idea. That um, is a good idea. Yes. Yeah, I've been yeah. very fortunate that my company... Well, my company's company, because I, I work for uh, I, I work for one company that basically dispatches teams to other companies. Mm. Mm -hmm. But my company's company is very good with uh, with remote. It has multiple locations. It has meetings that are always audio conferenced. So, so to bring yeah. on people and say you'll really be remote good. was easy. To transition during the pandemic was easy, and I. I really credit them, even though I am by contract not allowed to say who they are. <laughs> um, so, Fair enough. But uh, cool. yeah, it's definitely an so experience. You got your, you, do you have any pets, Alex? I do not, unfortunately. We want to have like I would love to have a cat, and my wife would love to have a cat, but 
I'm allergic to a lot of cats. So I try, I mean, yeah. And like it, it does. Yeah. Maybe, maybe those, those scary boys, but, uh, it's, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to figure out a good way to find a cat that I'm not allergic to. <laughs> Cause it would be awful to like adopt a cat, find yeah. out I'm super allergic, not get better and have to like bring them back. I think there's some sort of simple. like high hypoallergenic cat. Yeah. I've, I've looked into that and apparently, um, it's like, there's no doctor who's like, Oh, just get a hypoallergenic cat because that it turns out that term is like, uh, questionable. Not right. It's not the same as with but dogs. Yeah, apparently. They, yeah, yeah. But I, I know that there, there are sites online that talk about cats for people with allergies and yeah, yeah, everybody definitely. has a Sphinx first. I just did, uh, mm-hmm. which is a hairless cat, but there are cats that are more hair than fur yeah. and they don't kick up as much dander. Lady, uh, do you have any pets? I have a pet back home in Slovenia. He's a dog. He's like a 16-year-old border collie. Oh. Um, yeah, super cute. But uh, we've been thinking about getting a chicken for the house. Uh, <laughs> useful and cute. Yep. Um, but we'll see. The chickens seem to be sold out here where you could like order them. It seems like the same thing's happening in San Francisco because a friend of mine was like raving on about getting quails. And Ooh. ducks because the chickens are in low supply. It's oh my god! An interesting yeah, have time. You, have you heard of this off-brand of chicken called duck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. we were thinking of getting chickens. They weren't available, so we bought them back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All I have is this grizzly bear that they had. <laughs> yeah. It's like, the, it's like the Monty Python cheese sketch. It's like, do you have this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are, are they so? Besides chickens, uh, Leia in in London, is there is there panic buying of anything that's in low demand or in high demand? Um, I don't think not not really. Um, I know that for eggs, they do limit you to like two. Basically, like a carton is six eggs, so like um, two cartons per person yeah, or per household. You a dozen. Yeah, um, but like that's there were eggs that were running out for a little while, but it's kind of weird. People aren't taking it necessarily that seriously here. Um, there's like some restrictions of like how far apart you stay, how many people are let in a store. Um, but when I compare things to how it's like in Slovenia, where like my family is, uh, they're being super strict. Like there's fines for hanging out in a group of more than three where they're not from your, like your house. I think you pay like 500 euros if someone sees you doing that and you can only stay in like your like um, like legal entity <laughs> vicinity. You can't cross borders even in wow. Slovenia, which is like 2 million people. So the border is like, like a, a village of a thousand people to the next <laughs> village of a thousand people. Like you can't go between. Um, and yeah, they're just very, very strict. Like b- before you enter a store, for example, they'll 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 have they have a dude or a lady, I guess. Um, but they'll have a guard who will sanitize your hands, give you gloves and a face mask, and then send you in. And then they have cameras oh. inside watching if you touch anything before you and you don't take it. And if you touch something and you don't take it. Someone will come and reprimand you and either like throw oh, wow. that thing away or charge you. Like it's this yeah. Is, this is in Slovenia. Yeah, and I think probably that's like why they decided to do that was because they're right next to Italy. That makes um, sense. I mean Yeah, and they were like, Oh, this can't happen, this can't happen, like let's take all the measures, like all the measures now, everyone just don't move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also, my uncle works in a hospital, and um, oh, wow. he so he's there. He's a cardiologist, but like now everyone's been deployed on like finding out where the coronas are. <laughs> um, and they did this test on one guy for the coronavirus, like the COVID nineteen one, and uh, he tested negative four times. Um, and then it turned out he was positive, but they had already oh, released geez. him to another department where he infected everyone. Oh. So it's oh, like. No. Fuck, like how yeah like how can you tell like what yeah it's yeah, I, I, I wish testing were were more widespread and, and easier but you know, we're and still, reliable yeah i know but we're still in the early days of this 
Uh, fortunately, yeah. as far as I can tell, New York seems to be flattening out finally. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The rest of the country is 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 getting closer to their peaks. Um, yeah. We're just going to have to wait this out. It's going to be a very prominent part. I mean, one of the things that we did on this show is we would do a live cast of uh, Google I.O., a live cast of WWDC. And mm. my understanding is that Google I.O. is completely off the table yeah. this year. Yeah, they just canceled it. Uh, yeah. Not even a virtual version. Makes sense. Virtual. I think a lot of <laughs> conferences are being canceled, but this one that I'm doing app builders um, in May is not canceled. And we're going to be using hop in, hop in, hop in. I don't know how to say it. Software where it's like <laughs> remote conferencing. We have like stage networking, oh, wow. um, <laughs> si like side things, whatever. And it's, um, will yeah, should be interesting. Yeah. The conference conference world is seeing what they can do. I know that, uh, is it wizard world? Uh, I, I think it's Wizard, uh, which is a science fiction convention, mm -hmm. uh, is trying to pull together a Buffy the Vampire Slayer Angel Conference where all the <laughs> guests will be there virtually. And oh, okay. Be, and they'll be able to talk for a while and they'll take questions via chat. And, and they're charging admissions so that you can get the links to go into this thing, which, you know, I, I'll be curious to see how well this works, but... You know, it's it's a new world right now, and we're we're trying to see what we can do with it. Yeah, it should be very interesting. Um, I guess there's also a lot of opportunities right now for better tools to get developed for these types of scenarios. So, um, yeah, it's. I read an interesting article from I keep forgetting this person's name, but that guy who wrote. 21 lessons for the 21st century. <laughs> um, you all know Harari, I think. Um, yeah. mm. and he, wrote, he wrote about like, um, what are going to be the implications of this in the future? Like, like in the last, like when there was this like dramatic um, kind of panic in people that made them like reevaluate what their, what they value, like do they value their privacy or their health, for example. Um, like post-war thing, like measures that were kind of implemented in times of panic don't necessarily go away, but like you're implementing them without really thinking too much. So what what in 20 years is going to happen based on the decisions that were made in like rash times? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was, it was a, like, I didn't think about it on the grand, grander scale necessarily until I read that and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, this could really... Very much change how we do things. It might change things for the better. We'll see. Uh, we can hope. Oh, we can definitely. There is hope right now. Leah, I think that I think we've got a lot of recording down. I think we've got stuff for an after show. I think everything else. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure to, to chat and just get to know you. Um, you've been how long? Have you been at Ray Winderley? Uh, I think I started writing in 2016. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I love doing the show because I get to to meet all of the Ray Wendelick folks <laughs> and, and get yeah. to chat with them and, and, and learn so much. And I really want to thank you for your time today. And we will be putting the episode together. Uh, I'm going to do a sign-off for this, and then I'll just do a little bit of technical stuff for us for, for passing Sounds things good. around. So. Yeah. Thank you for watching the, the YouTube after show of this episode of the Ray Wenderlich podcast. We'll have the next episode up in a few weeks after that. Um, I don't really say Ray back to you, but Ray back to you. <laughs> <laughs> you do now. I do now. So nice. I'm going to stop this recording. As soon cool. as I get that one. Uh, All right. Stop recording.